So this is uh, something new we're trying, having a final plenary, because we had a very important topic to talk about, which is the Fort McMurray fire response. And uh, you were all, I hope, there last night and had a chance to see all of the different organizations involved in the Fort Mac fire response. And we wanted to have an opportunity for this community to hear more about exactly what happened, how did it happen, who responded, when, what was it like on site, what was it like off site. And so as you can imagine, with a great number of groups involved, it was hard to narrow down, okay, how are we going to present this? So we have narrowed it down to just three organizations who are going to present 20 minutes each on their experience of the Fort Mac fires. But there are certainly all the other groups in the room. And I just want to uh, be sure to remind us all of who all those groups were. We have the Alberta Animal Rescue Crew Society, or also known as ARCS, Alberta Spay Neuter Task Force, the Alberta SPCA, the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association, the Calgary Humane Society, the Edmonton Humane Society, the Fort Mac SPCA, Mika's Birdhouse, the Central Calgary, no, Central Alberta Humane Society, also known as the Red Deer and District SPCA, or formerly known as, and the Regional uh, Municipality of Wood Buffalo. So there's representatives of all those groups here in the room today. We have asked that um, Jeffrey from the uh, municipality the, that where Fort Mac sits to present on their experience of this fire response and uh, animal rescue. We've asked Tara from Fort Mac SPCA to present on their experience, obviously, as the animal welfare group located right in Fort Mac. And then Alberta SPCA, Tara, another Tara, who heads up Alberta SPCA as the organization responsible provincially for the response. They are each going to present, and then we will have an opportunity for discussion and conversation. And we do have a little bit of extra time as well today if we want to go over a bit if conversation is rich and lots of questions. In having this conversation with this group of individuals, they did want me to convey a few things to you before we get started about this, in that this uh, uh, response on this scale has never happened before in Canada. And it certainly had never happened before in Fort Mac. And so for Fort Mac and its residents, they're all still in recovery. So even the people who are going to be speaking you, to you today are still in recovery. Many of them lost their houses. It's still very fresh. It's still very raw. Maybe almost a year away from our memory, but it's not for them. It's very personal for everyone involved. And they're still all working through what happened, how did it happen, what was good about it, what was bad about it. How do we process all of this? And so they don't have all the answers, but they have been willing to come forward and in this very lovely, safe room, start to explore together some of the different pieces that they experienced. And they wanted to be sure, as I started off this presentation, that they are three of a number of groups that present, or sorry, that were part of this rescue, and they wanted to be sure that all of them were uh, recognized and that all of them were equally important in this response. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you, sorry, I have all my papers all over the place, Jeff, Jeff Simpkins. Uh, animals have always been a passion for Jeff, who uh, was raised immersed in farming, horses, and family pets. Working in the 90s as a civiculture surveyor on the BC coast, his experience with wildlife habitat deepened his dedication to addressing the needs of animals through responsible forest management. Returning to Ontario provided him with an opportunity to support the Peterborough Humane Society board and to volunteer as an OSPCA investigator. In 2002, he completed the University of Guelph's agriculture program with an honors degree in animal science and was awarded the InterVet Poultry Health Award. Uh, his work continued as a farmer in Guelph, a farm manager for the Donkey Sanctuary of Canada, and as a part-time clinic veterinarian technician. In 2004, he ventured into commercial agriculture and quickly developed a specialization in herd health and large commercial dairy and hog operations. From pre- and post-harvest civiculture plans to help address habitat needs of deer, bear, or spotted owls in the BC coastal forests to commercial herd health, 
best management practices and responsibility are Jeff's foundational philosophies in animal care. The challenge of building a municipal animal control team in Northern Alberta began in the late summer of 2014 for Jeff, ultimately servicing one of the largest and most diverse municipalities in Canada, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo. This opportunity led him to be involved in one of the largest national, sorry, natural disasters and domestic pet rescues in Canadian history. Please welcome Jeff. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody who came to our aid. Um, Canadians really proved their worth. Um, we were overwhelmed with people's interest and, and concern, not only for the people, but for pets. Um, and there's too many to mention, not only our resident community members who took their pets with them on airplanes, buses, cars, whatever they could find. They got a lot of these animals out. Um, like, like Tara said, this has never been done before. <coughs> um, so it was kind of kind of exciting to see that we had such a response from so many groups. I know quite a few dropped what they were doing and came. Now, our pet rescue largely focused on the safe entry into a disaster area, safe apprehension both of people and pets, communication and documentation. <clears throat> so the video mentioned the ICS program. Back in the 70s, this became a very popular management organization when you are in a disaster and it's called REAC, so the Regional Emergency Operating Center. <clears throat> I reported to the Chief of Bylaw Services, so the top block there would be the one that is in the REAC. That's the main person that this group would be reporting to. We also have a communications supervisor, animal control supervisor, <clears throat> and an external animal care center, or supervisor. So our communications person, <clears throat> their large responsibility was to do customer service and victim services. So people did lose their pets, people did lose their homes. It's very important that people do not burn out when we're having those conversations. People were very emotional and, and challenged. Um, so essentially what the victim services team did and the customer service team did was process any animal rescue requests that came in. We eventually got that online where people could get a hold of us. They were processing it. As pet owners, everybody knows, you're gonna ask more than once, where's my pet? Where is it? Can I get it? Where do I get it? <clears throat> we ask for the name, the age, the species, the location, any medical or special needs. Um, and it's an entry request to enter your property. So we uh, contact the owner afterwards with their disposition of their pet. Disposition's a, a strange word, but uh, it means where is your pet? Um, and we provide support for services and information that people will need. We also kept a database, uh, many of us did, but these guys kept the main database, which is, would update information that would have the IT within the disaster area, which doesn't always work. Update missing information by making phone calls and double checking it, generate category lists and statistics. The documentation needed to cover your five uh, Ws and the how, and ensure Freedom of Protection of Information Act, uh, help our field teams, <clears throat> and record the actions taken towards the pets, or with the pets. This was the big group that did the, the rescue part. Um, I was the animal control supervisor. Under the ICS system, you can't have more than seven people reporting to you, so we ended up breaking off into teams. The main teams was our animal rescue task force. We had an intake team, an animal care team, a veterinary triage team, we did eventually have a reunification team in town and an overflow animal care team. The basic rules in, uh, in the animal rescue task force, which I believe there was up to 70 people at one point in time, we went out in teams of two or three. We always had a peace officer who could record the information um, from the request from the owners to go into the building and we had an animal handler and we had a locksmith or a security person. So there was... Uh, there was definitely a lot of those going through town. <clears throat> Our intake team, once the officers came back with the pet, if they hadn't decided whether or not to feed on situ or remove the pet, sometimes you couldn't catch your cat that was up underneath the mattress, but if you fed the cat eventually, you could get your hands on the cat. <clears throat> They'd, uh, our intake team would receive the officers, document the animal location, um, where it went into the pet center, 
ensure that the, car the carrier was labeled, which is a big important one, notify animal care team, and they would management, manage our inventory um, reporting. The animal care team was largely animal health techs and animal handlers. They ensured and supported that the veterinarians got a chance to do an intake exam at all animals. Again, this is in Fort McMurray. Uh, and direct the pet to a designated area. So we had cats separate from our exotics, um, from our birds, from our dogs. <coughs> they would follow the veterinary uh, direction. So our animal care team would do that. They'd do the diet for them as well and direct the health decisions for transport. So if we had animals that needed to leave fairly quickly, they were quickly identified. <coughs> Our veterinary triage team, uh, we had multiple teams coming in. As you can imagine, there was a large number of animals. They did the case management. They would determine and liaison with our provincial body um, <coughs> and external hospitals and transfer that case out when possible. Our reunification team afterwards, um, I say afterwards, it was May the 16th that we changed over to where people were waiting to come and get their pet from Fort McMurray at re-entry. So we'd review the documentation, confirm that the people own the animal, um, and provision any legal documentation required for that claim. And our overflow um, care center team um, will be coming up to speak as well. They would receive our healthy pets follow the directions from the intake examination and ensure, again, the carrier documentation and release the documentation as directed. So that's the basic nuts and bolts of the ICS system. Obviously, we learned a few things. <clears throat> so we've broken this into challenges and then what we learned from it. So the pace of this, ex the pace of es escalation, sorry, um, we did this in about 46 hours from the time we knew that the fire was uh, making us leave. We had put together a pet care intake center under an ESS program for residents to come. We had pets to the side, one at McDonald Island, which we vacated uh, on May the 3rd, moved up to Anzac. Um, they weren't ready for us and there was a lot of people and a lot of pets. <clears throat> and eventually went to Lake Labiche and then returned back to Fort McMurray. This was all done within the 46 hour from May 3rd. What we learned from that, <clears throat> we got quite good at setting up an evac center. Um, we need to designate and secure quiet rooms for each individual species. We need to provide owners with restraint supplies. Not everybody had a leash, not everybody had a carrier, not everybody had what they needed. Um, and we need to have safe locations for containment. So dogs do get stressed in this environment. They look after their owners, cats uh, egg them on. So we used penalty boxes within the arenas that we had. Uh, owners were quite happy because the dog was contained and saved and they had control of where their pet was. One of the other challenges we met was the animal's needs. So <clears throat> unfortunately we found quite a few pets that were still intact, which changes behavior. We needed carriers and leashes for them food, water, uh, and kitty litter was at a high premium. There is stress and fear in all the pets that are coming in, not just the people, and they feed off the people, but the pets are stressed. Biosecurity is extremely challenging, and pets are gonna interact within crowds, whether they're just coming in or not. And what eventually happened is we found pets and families actually living in their cars and not coming into the evac center. So what we learned from that one is we need to uh, increase our public education for pet identification, whether that be a microchip, a collar, something. Please register your pet. We can't say it enough. And like Bob Barker, spay and neuter your pet, please, and help control the pet population and their behavior when you're evacuated. Um, the more we can prepare our pet owners for a go bag that includes their pet, the calmer and the easier this will be. Not that we're doing it again. <clears throat> pet diversity hit us. We had some great experts out there that came and helped us, and I will, will uh, not mention names, but uh, we had uh, quite a lot of pets that not all of us knew how to take care of, so our exotics. Um, we had birds, rabbits. We called them pocket pets, but this covered guinea pigs, gerbils, hamsters, hedgehogs. Yes, we had cats and dogs, not as many dogs as we expected. Dogs seemed to be easier to go with owners. Cats, not so much. They tend to hide. We had a lot of exotics, which included our snakes. I think the record was 69 snakes um, removed from one home. Um, bearded dragons, we had a caiman, 
ferrets, iguanas, turtles. We had butterfly eggs that someone called in so that we could get their butterfly eggs to them. Chameleons, monitor litters, lizards, and geckos. We also had quite a, quite a group of people dealing with livestock. So there were chickens, ponies, pigs, horses, um, and there were some goats as well, wolves. Uh, wolves, 99.9% .9 wolves. <laughs> And one of the big ones that came in was fish. A lot of people are really attached to their fish, and commercial businesses have fish as well. So what did we learn from that? We need to engage our local specialists, including all our veterinarians, all our pet shops. We need to provide technical fact, fact sheets to our basic caretakers who are bringing these animals into their emergency centers. Um, if our techs don't have a quick go-to, um, you know, your... your uh, Iguana needs this, this, and this, vitamin D and a light in certain temperatures, certain humidity in a spray bottle of water. Um, they are challenged. I know even what to request. Transportation became a challenge um, and handling. So this is very species specific. So we, we would separate uh, species. Predator and prey was one of the big ones that everybody had um, challenged. And we need to challenge our provincial and municipal governments to increase the positive message of registering your pets. This is what we use during an emergency to know what kind of services we have need for. And justification for when we make a request, we have the numbers to back it up and it's not a surprise. Um, one of the numbers that came out was potentially up to 40,000 pets left Fort McMurray. We had to rescue maybe 12 to 1,300. So most of the community did get those out. We don't have a great registry, it's a guess. <clears throat> The other challenge that came up, and this is more to the emergency service centers coming in, um, many people went through Lake Labish uh, for months. I think it was uh, 69 days they actually utilized that emergency center. Um, people, services, language, there's eight known different languages in Fort McMurray, which surprised me. Uh, so interpreters are a very important part of, and it may be simple as a sheet with the question written out in their language and a yes or a no so that you can determine what kind of services they require. Cultural, uh, cultural needs, cultural awareness. We have Aboriginal groups. We have multiple other groups that have traditions. Um, in some cultures, uh, women don't speak to men and men don't speak to women, which is kind of challenging in an emergency service center to come through. And our social economics. Uh, we need to engage our community service groups that deal with the homeless and they know who the homeless are and they know who, what the homeless need. <clears throat> Communication. Um, this was sent forth loud and clear on May the 4th that we need to get our pets rescued. <clears throat> Information is going to come from multiple sources. Social media that we can be judged in about five minutes by about 20,000 people, no problem. There's lots of other media that are going to be wanting to know what's going on. We need to coordinate with multiple agencies. Our cell phones need to work, and we need to have chargers in power. And our tech support and troubleshooting. So if the network gets plugged, we need to come up with, um, we need to come up with making that work. <clears throat> so what did we learn from that? We need to provide very frequent information updates, and it has to have a clear message. People don't really want to know what they might be able to do. They want to know what they're supposed to be doing right now, what they need to take with them, and what direction they're going. We need to establish our communications team in the REAC extremely quickly. They are now one of the top three. So we have an emergency services director who is running the show. He has an information officer and a health and safety officer right beside them immediately to this size of scale. <clears throat> We need to hold more response team briefings. So if you only have seven people reporting to you, you need to update them. The 10 at 10, which has seemed to come out in this conference, it's really important to communicate. And our IT supports are really vital. One of the big ones that's come up is training. So the general understanding of emergency service and ICS method isn't there with the public, may not be there with some of the rescue groups, may not be there with some people that want to volunteer. They don't understand always legal jurisdiction. Do I have to? Do I not? Personal care requirements and their expectations when they come in. And conduct when you're in, an, in a disaster area and peer care. It's really important. So what we've set up and learned from this one is uh, we're going to provide to our volunteers within the community four basic courses. 
uh, basic ESS, ICS 100, basic emergency management, and an introduction to a reception center. The benefits of this, you're going to have confidence in your role as a volunteer. You're going to understand the process and why it might take a couple hours to get an answer. You're going to feel valued in your role, and your morale is going to increase. I'm going to be really quick on these ones because I'm told I'm running quick or slow. Donations, and I hope the other two can speak to this. They were overwhelming. Um, the sheer volume was something we couldn't handle um, as one person or as two people. You have to manage perishables. People are going to donate everything. They'll clean out their closet. They'll send up the torn pants. They'll send up the broken cage with no door. <clears throat> and people will donate things that you don't need, and they'll drop them off at unsolicited sites. So they'll say, did you get my trailer down on 63 just past 881? No, we didn't. We didn't know it was there, but thank you for dropping it off. <clears throat> <clears throat> so what we learned from that is we need to have an out-of-site evacuation center to coordinate the donations. Uh, we need to update the public on what we need, <clears throat> and we need to record that. And the transport into the community has to be done with safe transport to the areas that need it. The biggest savior here, um, the team that I have that does the ES emergency center for pets consists of four people and myself at the time. Uh, one of them was off on maternity leave, so essentially there was three of us <coughs> at the start. But the understanding from a disaster, emergency chasers do exist and they will come. Multiple groups are going to request to help you. They're highly specialized, very, very talented, and very, very energetic. And you may not be. <laughs> There's conflicting expectations among all volunteers. So some are coming in, they're expecting to burst into burning homes and get the cat. That doesn't happen. And rogue activity will happen. <clears throat> One of the things we need to learn and what volunteers need to learn. We have to accommodate you when you come into a disaster. That includes your food. And we have to have the ability to keep you safe. <clears throat> so you can see under here what we learned. Single source volunteer regroupment and our entry documentation is really, really important. Verify who they are. Make sure they're ready to go in. Make sure they know what they're going into. Give them an ID badge and make sure you know when they leave. So we're in recovery and reentry right now. When we came in on July the 1st, or June the 1st, or is it July 1st, you saw how much had to be done. We didn't have clean water, we didn't have hydro, we didn't have heat. All those basic things weren't there for the community to come back in until June the 1st. People coming back in are going to need to realize that the community has very limited services anyway, even though the town is open again. People are going to bring their pets, irregardless. There's going to be security everywhere. Pets are going to be restressed, um, and they have a reduced immune response or capacity for that. Everyone is going to be emotional, so you're going to have mental health issues throughout the community. Pets are going to need temporary living care, not the car. Some owners will choose to have not rescued their pets, which surprised a lot of people. Everybody assumed that if you had a pet, you would call in and get your pet rescued. And veterinary services can be hours away. So during reentry, we need to make sure that we provide the basic supplies at the welcome centers. That's pet food, kitty litter, carrier, leash, whatever they forgot or weren't ready for. All responders are going to have mental health needs. All responders are going to have lost and property damage. We need to ex extend our pet claim holds, provide short-term kenneling, and provision veterinary care until all those services can come back up into place. The key message here is pets' lives were saved by many. The motto of the pet rescue <coughs> was every life matters, and that stuck with us all. And it wasn't really why we did it, it's how we did it, which we had to do it safely, and we had to do it together. Thank you.
All right. Well, wow, that was a great window into the municipal response. And I have a million questions about incident command and training everybody on it and how to get us all ready because the next disaster will happen. So thank you, Jeff. I'd like to now introduce you to Tara Clark, who is the executive director of the Fort McMurray SPCA. She oversees the organization's administration, activities, developments, programs, operations, strategic plan implementation, marketing, community outreach, and all of the organization's collaborative relationships. And I'm just laughing because, you know, we all feel that, right? It's like, here's that long list of everything I do. Um, the Fort Mac SPCA is the only local animal shelter in the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, caring for and sheltering up to thousands of homeless, abused, and neglected animals every year, in addition to satellite services and supports throughout the rural and reserve areas. At 66,361 square kilometers, the region is the second largest municipality in Canada. Last year, Tara led the Fort McMurray SPCA team in concert with other rescue organizations that were under the leadership of the uh, sorry, Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo to play a key role in the pet rescue efforts during the May wildfires that ravaged the region. Fort McMurray SPCA was the only agency providing pivotal programs, supports, and services for pets and pet-owning households throughout the region's urban and rural areas. Emergency and relief services directly impacted more than 5,000 animals in need and more than 1,950 pet owners. In addition to being the hub for the regional relief services and humane owner surrender to prevent pet homelessness and suffering, Tara collaborated with key members of her team to produce a series of community impact surveys, the second of which was just completed, to measure the impacts of the wildfire on animal welfare and pet owners, to determine emerging needs and program gaps, as well as to measure important feedback from the community members who survived the second natural disaster experienced in Woof, sorry who survived the second natural disaster experienced in Wood Buffalo since 2013 and the largest natural disaster in Canada's history please welcome Tara to the stage wow that was like half my speech um. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, and thank you all for being here today. It's an absolute, uh, it's an absolute honor to share with you some of our experiences and what we've learned so far, as you uh, all know from what uh, Jeff has shared thus far. On May 3rd, 2016, a wildfire swept through Fort McMurray, forcing more than 88,000 residents to evacuate. Due to the unprecedented conditions in the community, many families were forced to leave without their pets. The Fort McMurray SPCA played a supporting role to the RMWB, who was a lead agency in the pet rescue efforts. As you are all aware, and, ha and what has already been mentioned, but I would like to um, reiterate again, this effort was um, undertaken by numerous organizations from across the province, to the Alberta Animal Rescue Crew Society, the Alberta Spay and Neuter Task Force, the Alberta Veterinarian and Medical Association, Barhead Animal Rescue, the Calgary Humane Society, Canine Action Group, Central Alberta Humane Society, Edmonton Humane Society, Global Animal Lovers, Classic Kennels, Mika's Birdhouse, Saving Grace Animal Sanctuary, Second Chance Animal Rescue, and if there are any other agencies I might have forgotten, I want to take a moment to thank you on behalf of the Fort McMurray SPCA and regional pet owners for helping to save lives and make a difference. We are forever grateful for your support during that time. The Fort McMurray SPCA shelter actually evacuated on the evening of May 1st when a voluntary evacuation order was called for the neighborhood in which the shelter is located. The pets in our care at the time were placed with foster families in areas of the city that were under less threat. That evening, we also provided supplies and food to the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo. Although the evacuation order was downgraded to a shelter in place on Monday, we decided to leave our shelter pets with their foster families until, that area until our neighborhood was cleared completely, as this was one of the few areas impacted in the city at the time. By 2 p.m. on Tuesday, many of our employees who lived in the most impacted neighborhoods of Abbasand and Beacon Hill were under a mandatory evacuation. Like thousands of others, many of our staff lost their homes and everything in them including myself and my operations manager, Misha, who is here today. It's hard to imagine the scope of the wildfire, even if you have seen photographs or news footage. 
I'm proud to say that our devoted foster families not only safely evacuated themselves and their own pets, but the SPCA pets in their care as well. In some cases, we arrived at evacuation centers in the region, only to have to evacuate a second time as the wildfires continued to grow. Our staff, board, and volunteers, like so many of the 88,000 souls evacuating, were scattered over hundreds of kilometers and locations in Alberta and beyond, seeking shelter and safety with family and friends. Our community was under a declared state of emergency. In response to the thousands of messages we received on Thursday, May 5th, we made a formal request to have an FMSPCA contingent re-enter the community to support the pet rescue efforts being undertaken and led by the RMWB. These efforts were to use the Fort McMurray SPCA shelter, its resources and clinic as its base of operations. The rescue was scheduled to take place over a 96 hour period. On the morning of Friday, May 6, less than 72 hours after being evacuated, myself and a team of board members, staff and volunteers made the drive back to our evacuate, from our evacuation points to support the pets still in our community. I can tell you when we drove in, the fires and smoke on both sides of the highway as we made our way back to our shelter was a very sobering welcome. Our shelter was impacted by heavy smoke, there was no running water and no electricity. Our team who has emergency response experience and training began the task of or organizing, auditing and gathering pet food and supplies. Getting our shelter phone systems to forward to cell phones so that calls from our community could be answered in real time. Supply lists and volunteer lists were developed and submitted to the RMWB for approval and procurement. The shelter was ready to triage, care for and house pets that would be extracted and sheltered until their eventual transport out of the emergency zone. And as Jeff mentioned, over the duration of the pet rescue, our team helped to catalog, feed and clean and care for a number of animals, including geckos, birds, snakes, rabbits, bearded dragons, chinchillas, cats, dogs, hedgehogs, hamsters, guinea pigs, and so many more. Um, until their eventual transport to Edmonton where hundreds of worried pet parents waited to be reunified with them. When we exited the emergency zone, we immediately began preparing for the thousands of pets and pet families requiring our support upon their ability to re-enter our community. We did this by gathering data through our first community impact survey, which we launched in May 2016. I believe that one of the most important things I can share with all of you is our experience and the lessons that we've learned so far with the size and scope of the disaster in our region. This was an unprecedented emergency. So there was a lack of historical information to draw from. As you can all imagine, we faced a lot of challenges. We also learned a lot in the process, some of which I'll share with you. Um, the first challenge we faced was the conditions in the emergency zone. It was unclear as we traveled back to the community, um, the conditions and personal protection equipment requirements were not known. Although we came with food and supplies because there was a lack of, uh, a, um, a lack of electricity and running water, we were unable to prepare the food and perishables went to waste. Uh, there was significant smoke in our shelter and much of our inventory equipment um, and resources had been exposed. Challenges with hygiene resulted in many participants getting ill over the, the coming days. Another challenge was community expectation that the local animal shelter would be involved in the emergency response and saw us and likely many of you in similar roles as ultimately responsible for animal welfare and advocacy for your community. Even with the incredible and heroic work undertaken by and needed from out of community organizations. Residents expected the local SPCA and welfare agencies to be involved, which provided them with a sense of hope and assurance that everything was being done possible to save animals' lives. Communications was another obstacle we faced. Communications are vital, a vital part of successful programming services during normal operations. However, during an emergency, they become even more essential. Within minutes of the mandatory evacuation being ordered, our organization's media platforms were inundated with requests for information from the public as well as out of community media. Having a channel for regular updates to the community would have assured local residents who had not been able to evacuate with their pets that efforts would be undertaken to assist their furry family members. What resulted was a lack of accurate information, escalating stress and anxiety 
and causing confusion for pet owning residents. One of our biggest challenges was the emergency impact on our resources and access to funding. While we were evacuating along with our community, trying to get to safety and shelter, sometimes evacuating more than once, we had an inability to set up and promote a fundraising tool for our organization directly, or even communicate how to donate directly. Even when we returned to the community to support the pet rescue efforts, without electricity and staff still displaced, we were unable to complete grant streams for resources or funding, which left our organization vulnerable in both receiving donations intended for our agency or access to relief funding in time. Although we face challenges, we also experience success. Um, the first success cannot be overstated that through collaboration and collective effort, approximately 1,200 pets were extracted, sheltered, and transported out of the emergency zone. We were also able to place our shelter pets that had been evacuated by FMSPCA foster families with organizations such as ARCS and the Alberta Spay and Neuter Task Force who went to incredible lengths to pick up and transport our shelter pets to relieve our foster families, providing those pets the opportunity to be placed in an adoption program without delay. The list of suppliers that contacted us during the emergency and evacuation to provide food, medical supplies, and animal support supplies was truly overwhelming. Hills, Bowringer, Advantex, Summit, Royal Medical Cannon, Kong, Trupanion, Quality X-Ray, Z Medical, Pet Value, PetSmart Charities of Canada, the Four Feet Foundation, the Edmonton Humane Society, Acana, the City of Edmonton, the Alberta SPCA, Royal Duck Shell, and so many more not only assisted us in procuring needed items during and post evacuation, but also assisted in replacing, replacing goods that had been lost, exposed, or damaged during the re-entry phase. The outreach from, a com from communities across Canada and beyond, from lemonade stands to car washes, to benefit concerts, to children's birthday parties in lieu of gifts, collected donations and supplies for our community. This was profound, touching, and awe-inspiring. The handmade cards, the messages of hope and support, some of them marked on the boxes and bags you sent us. We read every bag, every message, every letter. We can never express how appreciated they were. They hold a place of honor in our shelter to remind us of your heartfelt wishes for our community. Having an in-shelter veterinarian clinic that was utilized by participating veterinarians and support personnel to triage and treat animals being taken into care under one roof was essential to the emergency for the safe stay and evacuation of those pets that had been extracted. In May 2016, we began circulating community impact surveys, not only to assess immediate needs but further determine supports that would be required by the community upon re-entry. This tool has been invaluable and well received. We continue to reach out to hear directly from regional pet owners. Some of what we learned was not what we had been advised nor anticipated would take place during and post disaster. An animal welfare agency would expect certain impacts post disaster one of which being a significant increase in animal, in animal intake and rehoming needs. In anticipation of this, we instituted free owner surrender services. It was also assumed that in community adoption rates would decrease. This, however, did not hold true for our community. Adoption rates increased as residents sought the mental and wellness benefits of adding a pet to their household. Although our animal intake did increase by 29%, our adoption rate saw an increase of 18% post wildfire. One of the most telling statistics from our community impact survey is almost 90% of respondents felt that pet companionship provided direct benefits to their well being during and after the wildfire. Common themes included helping with anxiety, depression, stress relief, emotional support, stability, and overcoming fear. Many, many parents commenting on the direct benefits pets had on their children. Okay, I'm going to skip through a little bit because I have about two minutes here now. 
quickly key learnings. Um, it's imperative to create a pet emergency response plan for your organization, but also have information available for pet owning households in case of emergency if you don't already. This creates resiliency in pet owners and addresses their unwillingness to evacuate without their pets. Our advice, pets and humans together whenever possible to keep pet owning families stronger together. Establish a formal partnership with an agency outside of your jurisdiction. This agency can support you in funding, communications, the storing of donated supplies, which as Jeff mentioned, should not be underestimated. Um, we learned that 90% of the response and funding support you are going to need comes after the rescue. The ongoing long-term support of pet owning households is imperative. Pet surrender, new programming and service needs over an extended period of time should be included in your, included in your emergency and recovery planning. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here. I'm gonna move right to the thank you then. Um, in closing, I would like to thank the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies for the opportunity to be here today and share our perspective and experience on the wildfires. I would also like to thank again all those agencies who came to Fort McMurray to help save pets' lives for your efforts on behalf of the worried pet owners in our community and making pet reunification possible during some of our darkest days. Finally, to all of you in the room whose communities, shelters, kids, veterinarians, and pet lovers took the time to write us a note of encouragement, who donated to us, who sent us food and supplies to offer hope to pet owning families in our community. For those of you who prayed for us, who were pulling for us, we will be forever grateful for your kindness and support. Thank you all so much for making a difference and helping to save lives. Thank you so much, Tara, uh, and thank you for the research. I'd like to hear more about that afterwards as you compile more of your data. Uh, we can certainly get it out there and share it broad and wide for you. I'd now like to introduce another Tara, because there's a lot of Taras in Alberta. I just want to say that out loud, and a lot of them are running animal welfare agencies. <laughs> uh, Tara Johnson has worked at the Alberta SPCA since 1993, but her relationship with the organization began years earlier as a volunteer. She became the executive director in 2004, and her experience working in a variety of roles within the Alberta SPCA has helped give her a deep understanding of the organization's operational needs that have strengthened her leadership. Tara has built a strong relationship with the Alberta SPCA and other animal law enforcement emergency response agencies as she has directed the organization's activities in animal protection and humane education as well as its involvement in the Fort McMurray Animal Rescue. She shares her home in St. Albert, uh, Albert, Alberta with her husband, Darren, their two children, Davis and Reagan, their two cats, Seamus and Gilly, and their dog, Bochi. Bochi. Please welcome Tara to the stage. Our mandate is to protect, promote, and enhance the well-being of animals in Alberta. And within that, that piece, uh, we have a number of programs that we have, uh, one of which is our animal protection services. And um, with that, uh, we've got 11 sworn peace officers who enforce the Animal Protection Act. And I think that's sort of really an important point um, for the work that we did um, on behalf of the municipality and, and Tara's group. Um, because we had peace officer staff and because we enforced the Animal Protection Act, that gave us the legal uh, authority to take custody of animals. And so um, where, where there was animals that were being removed and extracted from homes in Fort McMurray, um, and they were being moved out of the fire zone um, into a location in Edmonton, we, because we have that authority as peace officers, we could legally take those animals and take custody of them 
And we were very, very fortunate because the animals that we received, and it's really a testament to Jeff and his, his crowd and, and to Tara, that so many of the animals that we received in the park facility were healthy. By and large, I, I don't suggest for a minute that they weren't highly stressed, that there weren't issues with the animals, but they didn't come with major medical conditions. Um, they were not heavily compromised. So um, in, in that respect, um, you know, if there was a requirement for, for treatment of the animals, we, we could authorize it or our peace officers could authorize that treatment. Um, but again, fortunately, that wasn't necessarily an issue uh, for us. And, and fortunately, very few of the animals that came on to the site um, were, we, we had a number of deceased on site, but by and large, in terms of the tota total number that we had, that we received at park, just under 1,200, very, very few deceased um, and very few loss, very, very little loss of life. In terms of this piece, the municipality was uh, took the lead on this piece. Uh, they worked through the Alberta Emergency Management Act, giving the, the municipality the authority to manage all things emergency response. And in terms of the emergency response, um, there was a couple of key dates, which I think are are somewhat, um, I think they're essentially repeated through, through both Jeff and Tara's uh, uh, previous presentations, but Tuesday, May 3rd was an important date for our organization. Um, that's when, of course, the mandatory evacuations were occurring. And that's also the date that our organization, who had a, a, sort of a relationship with, the, with Wood Buffalo previously, we had reached out to them and said, if there's anything that we can do, um, you know, please let us know. So um, with that in mind, uh, we continue Wednesday, May 4th. We've got um, a concern that we recognize there, there might have been impacted livestock, which there was. Um, though having said that, um, when we looked at the premise ID, which is the registration system for livestock in Alberta, we didn't actually uh, identify a lot of impacted livestock. That's not to say that there weren't, but there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't the registration numbers. So there was a lot of livestock, but they were unregistered. So our concern was somewhat appeased at, at that point. As, as I said, though, later on, we did find out that there were um, certainly some that, uh, that were impacted. The other... Um, uh, piece is we, we took on a, a support role, um, which was just to offer clearance uh, in, through the emergency zone for um, any supplies that were requested by Wood Buffalo. So we as an organization acted in a support role to give that clearance. Thursday, May 5th was a, a key point, obviously, because we've got uh, a province-wide state of emergency that was declared. And that was also the date that uh, Wood Buffalo had asked uh, for us to send peace officers up. And so we certainly did. Uh, we were, were, were very happy to do that. Um, so two peace officers, essentially self-contained, uh, went up to the, the fire. They loaded their trucks up. Uh, they had extra water, extra food, uh, certainly um, a change of clothes for five to seven days. I mean, they really were self-contained and ready to, to do the work that they were asked to do, which in this case, I believe, was team leads. Um, and so again, I, I just repeat that piece around the APA and the, the fact that our peace officers have the authority to um, make decisions on behalf of the animal in, in the absence of an owner. And of course, we know that there was many owners that were back in other jurisdictions or other locations and uh, wor weren't in a position to give um, any sort of direction as it, as it pertained to their animal. Um, so this is also the date that uh, May 6th, of course, was a, a big date because this was the date that, that Wood Buffalo had uh, asked us to stand up a reception and reunification center. Um, they asked quite late in the day, and we were, of course, happy to assist in any way we... I, I think we were happy to assist. I, I, I don't think that we recognized the scope of what we were agreeing to at the time, um, but certainly we, we, we were quite desperate to, to help. Um, so uh, our, the Wood Buffalo had identified, uh, when they requested us to, to assist, they had identified a very specific timeline, which was 96 hours. Uh, there was a discussion around the number of animals that would be uh, sent to us, which was about five to 700 animals, which at the time, I think it was felt in the information that, that you were working off of was mostly dogs. And so that's really what we were prepping for. 
Um, and again, to be clear, and very clear that the objective around this was really about reunifying owned animals. It's not to suggest that there weren't some stray animals in the mix, and I, I don't want to suggest that, that that wasn't a concern, but in terms of the, the, the uh, request that had been made to us, it was very specific to owned animals. And I think we took that, I know we took that very, very seriously. I think we recognized that um, these people that had to leave very suddenly um, were certainly in crisis themselves. Uh, they were um, didn't know if they were going to come home to a home when they got back. And again, the importance of this animal was vital. And and I think that it's vital to us anyways, this group. Um, and so we, we certainly took it very seriously and we're, we're very, um, very keen to assist and took it very seriously. And I've just cited uh, a little statistic that 8 in 10 um, households see their pets as, as uh, members of, of their, their home and as part of the family. And I would suggest to you that probably in this room it's, it's a higher number. So uh, to be clear, what our role was was the coordinating agency. Um, we by no means did this alone. Uh, we, were sim we were simply, or, or not so simply, the coordinating agency, and within that responsibility, there was a number of uh, items t to, to complete, which was the receiving, the cataloging, the triaging, the caring for um, animals in our care, and ensuring that the people that were uh, requested to assist with that task, that they were safe as well. And so um, we did use the incident command system um, program that, that uh, Jeff had already explained earlier in his presentation, so that was used. Um, I think that from our perspective, that's, that's well understood within our agency. Uh, our law, many of our peace officers are, are law enforcement, and, and that's certainly not, a, not unknown to them. And in fact, they deploy that system on their day-to-day -day work. So again, very familiar with and very comfortable within that system. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't again, and I know we've said it a number of times about who was involved um, throughout this whole process. And when I talk about this, I'm really talking about who was involved directly at the People and Animal Reunification Center at the park. So I, I really want to be clear that there was a lot of groups involved, and we truly, truly could not have managed this in the absence of any one of these groups. Um, Alberta Veterinary Medical Association was um, uh, very involved initially in the planning stage, and they brought in Alberta Spay-Neuter Task Force, who has a lot of experience in animal intake and in terms of large numbers of animals. Um, Alberta Agriculture staff certainly helped us as well. Um, we also had the Edmonton Humane, who kind of got it at both ends. So they were had some direct involvement in the park facility itself, but they were also acted as a secondary care site for many of the animals that were not reclaimed at the closure of park. So again, they were involved at, at both ends. We've also got Calgary Humane Society, Central Alberta Humane Society, formerly Red Deer and District. Um, we've also got Central, uh, uh, sorry, Alberta uh, Rescue Crew Society, ARCS, and Mika's Birdhouse. And again, those groups acted as a secondary care site for when the park was ultimately closed down. Um, so I in terms of um, how the timeline went on, uh, it was, a, I, I want to say, a relatively quick turnaround. It wasn't. It didn't feel like it. Um, but in terms of, of how this occurred, uh, we've got May 6, which was the date that we were invited to participate in this park and to coordinate the park facility. Um, May 7th, we secured a facility. And that was no short order, let me tell you. <laughs> um, the May uh, 8th is when, it, 7th and 8th, we, we readied that facility for uh, receipt of, of animals. May 9th, we received our first transport of animals, which was 386 in total. And that was in the middle of the night, um, at, at 3 a.m. actually. And then the park closed down May 19th at 5 p.m. Um, the other sort of key date would be the date that we, um, well, we, we transferred all of the unclaimed animals to secondary care sites, and June 30th was the date that we transferred ownership of animals to the secondary care site. So from May 19th to June 30th, there was attempts made to en engage with the owners and try and encourage them or manage their retrieval of their animals. And I know it has come to some surprise. It's been mentioned on a couple of occasions that people didn't pick up their animals, and that's definitely true. Their circumstances might have changed, and they made a choice to relinquish the animal. 
but essentially on June 30th, we made the decision to transfer ownership of the animals still in the care of the secondary care site to the secondary care site so that those animals could be moved through their existing rehoming systems. Um, so I, I think I've mentioned this a little bit already, but the park zone operated out of the fire zone. Um, so we, we, in the Alberta Emergency Management Act, those who are working within the fire zone are given fairly wide swathing powers in that zone to manage whatever it is that they need to manage. Outside of the zone, though, it's not the case. And so again, I, I, I mentioned that we've, we've used our Provincial Animal Protection Act to manage the custody and care of the animals that were entrusted with us. Um, specifically within our act, we identified a section 4.1, uh, which is an abandonment um, of an animal. Now, no one is suggesting for a minute that anyone chose to abandon those animals um, of their own volition. It was because of the circumstance. But nevertheless, because it was identified as an abandoned animal, that gave us the legal authority to take custody of those animals, regardless of whether they were in distress or not. And... Uh, the other uh, uh, piece of that is that it, it would, uh, again, I've, I've mentioned this previously, but again, giving us the authority to, uh, su su to provide treatment to animals that may be uh, requiring treatment when they're in our custody, as well as providing a framework for assigning a caretaker for, for, um, for the animal. So for instance, if the owner still wants to retain the animal but doesn't have the ability to manage that animal, we could assign a caretaker for that animal. And uh, the other thing is legal the transfer of legal uh, ownership of the animal. So when we were securing the space uh, that we ultimately uh, received, we, we didn't have a lot of choice, to be quite honest. We had two options. Uh, two of them were, which was unused warehouse space. With the information that we had at the time, though, we knew we needed a large space. We knew that we needed to separate the public area from the animal holding area. We knew that we needed uh, a triage and an intake area. We knew we needed uh, volunteer areas and rest areas, wash areas, uh, certainly uh, restrooms and available parking for the public when they did come and re be reunited with their, their pets. So in terms of our planning, and this has already been identified, um, but we again plan for five to 700 animals uh, and mostly dogs. And of course, this is the breakdown of what we actually receive. So much, much different. And I think Jeff's already mentioned that um, th that came with certain um, requirements that were, were sometimes difficult to, to manage. In terms of resourcing needs, uh, we needed lots of bodies. I mean, that lots and lots of warm bodies. <laughs> That's really stating the obvious. Uh, we needed veterinarians and registered veterinarians, uh, technologists to triage animals. Uh, we recognized we needed people to, to manage the animal intake, uh, the ongoing care requirements, uh, and then the reunification process, uh, facility management, and uh, safety officer or security of the building. So all of that was requirements and things that we had to contemplate when we were managing this piece. So we, we had approximately just, well, just under 600 staff or volunteers, and uh, about half of our staff, uh, Albert SBCA staff, worked at this, uh, the, the park. In terms of the equipment and supplies, I could go on for days on what we really had to secure very quickly, but it would be all of the administrative stuff, the papers, the pens, the computers, the, the IT needs, the chairs, desks, et cetera. We needed all of that in addition to housing for the different species that we had, uh, were, had to care for, and that presented some issues. Um, certainly food for the various species of animals, including um, worms and crickets and whatnot for, for reptiles and amphibians, which wasn't always easy to, to get, but we certainly managed. One of the sort of things that I was reflecting on is, is the need to secure a type of food for your dogs and cats. They're already under stress. They're probably not feeling well. Um, and so you want to, and, and, and there was no guarantee that what, what we were feeding at the park was what they ha had originally received in their home. So securing a type of food that was really sensitive to their stomach was important, and we certainly managed that. 
kennels, food, litter, litter pans, cage cards, um, heaters, you name it, we needed all of that and um, were able to secure that. Laundry was a, was a real challenge at the park. I don't know how you found that, but cleaning the number of, of kennels that we did on a daily basis was significant and the, the laundry that was generated as part of that was really, it was significant. I, I, in one day, I think we had uh, accrued 27 green baggage green garbage bags worth of, of material to be cleaned. Um, and then the dumpsters for recycling and, oh, three minutes, okay. So I'm gonna just focus on data management because I think this is a real key piece. Um, this was one of our lessons learned. We didn't have an appropriate data management. We, we had an appropriate ma data manage management system. It wasn't as effective or efficient as we would have liked. Um, I, I think that, you know, with all of the information that had to be included in this piece and the multiple groups that were utilizing it for various reasons, whether it be the vet, whether it be the reunification team, the animal intake team, um, all of the different pieces around that. And then, of course, you've got privacy information as well, and you want to protect the privacy piece. So I think that was, that was th there was a lack of a, a database that for this purpose. And I think if there's nothing else that we can do from this exercise, I think it's to create some sort of database for this specific pur purpose and, and someone who um, can be deployed to operate the database in, in the affected area. So I think that's a really key point. Um, transportation, I, a lot of this has already been touched on by the previous presenters, but one of the things that we learned, um, transport buses where you can control the climate um, really, really important was the preferred method of transportation for the animals, where there needs to be a constant temperature. So that's a really important piece. Um, again, uh, I think one of the other lessons, and I'm, I'm just going really, really quickly here, um, challenges with layout of the building. Um, I'll go to lessons learned at this point. Oh, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, l lessons learned. Um, well, there was a lot of them. Um, I think that when I was reflecting on this piece and reflecting on what happened, what we could have done better, what we did really well, I, I think that I would say um, we did a pretty amazing thing. I think that um, it, and this is sort of the same thing that Jess said, it offered a very good opportunity to remind people to uh, to ID your pets and register them. It's a big, big win there. Um, that this is not something that any one agency can do alone. I think with this kind of a, a magnitude of an event, you need to work together and you need to work towards a common objective. And I think there's a real opportunity to build that capacity amongst these groups. I think that um, I think the time is is now is to build relationships and build trust. And I, I know there's been lots of talk about a plan and, and having a plan, and I think that's incredibly important. And I, I really encourage that. I think almost the mo more important piece, though, is is the planning. It's the exercise of planning and the exercise of again. Um, collaborating with with people for a common purpose and again to build those relationships now and build a level of trust with the various groups uh, scale up that's a big one I, I learned the hard way that we didn't secure um, enough of certain things so my suggestion to anybody facing this scale up and, and sort of take your foot off the gas when, when you've established the actual need. So get more bodies than you need, get more supplies than you need, really scale up and then take it back when, when the original or the uh, actual need has been established. Um, considering as a central repository, again, I'm, I'm probably saying the same things that the groups before us have mentioned, but a central repository for equipment, I think that is a really important piece. Um, consider your transport needs, and again, those uh, those buses, those, those are, I think, in my opinion, I think Jeff probably would agree with me, that's probably the preferred method. Um, that database is a critical piece, um, and one of the things that I've learned having gone through this and speaking to others who have done this, the similar experience in, in maybe a bit of a smaller scope is that plan for the exotics, the amphibians, the reptiles, consistently 
people who have done this have said, we were quite surprised that there was this many reptiles and amphibians in our community. They just didn't have any idea. So I think, you know, make sure that you've got, um, you've identified the, the individuals who can manage those animals, can care for those animals, know what those animals need in terms of care and uh, um, housing and whatnot, and make sure you have that. And then the communication plan, I'll just uh, mention that, uh, again, this has been touched on, communication plan for the groups that you're working with. Um, that's a really important piece uh, for the public, for owners and caretakers, and how to uh, handle media. So, and again, um, at, the, at the conclusion of this, we did have a number of debriefs, debriefs, and I would really encourage that exercise for anyone who's gone through something like this, and really watch your people. I, I think, you know, we didn't have the difficult conditions that Tara and Jeff went through. I mean, they went through insurmountable issues, and, and I, I quite frankly can't, can't even know that you're still standing, and, uh, and you haven't lost your mind. But um, having said that, even the people that worked at the park, I mean, there was certainly people that went through really difficult things that, that people are tired um, they're hopefully feeling appreciated, but they may not be. They've got a lot of work ahead of them, and it's really, it's it's really hard work. It's really uh, heavy lifting, and I would really encourage people to check in on your people, make sure that they're okay and feeling okay with what they've done and what they've just been through, and again, just ensure that those debriefs um, have have occurred. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Tara, and thank you for that window into what it was like to uh, manage an emergency response from a distance off-site uh, and to work with multiple partners on it. We now have time for questions. Uh, we do have two mics um, up there if you want to ask this amazing team any questions, as well as I'm sure others in the room that were part of the response will be happy to answer questions. Um, I, I, I'm speechless. Um, <laughs> I applaud you and all of the people in your community in your province um, for what you did um, and, and how you got through even this afternoon. Um, my question, I, I'm just curious, um, because for those of us that really were at, at a distance and just reading media and trying to understand and appreciate what was going on, so the stories that make the headlines are, you know, I've left my dog, he's crated, can you go and get him? And I'm wondering, as you re-entered to go and start to bring the pets out that had been left behind, um, can you talk just a little bit about um, were they were they in fact in in crates? Were they? I, I appreciate the cats were hiding. Um, what what kind of state um, were the animals in as you as you entered and and started to bring them out to safety? Just give it a try, Jeff. It might work. Nice. Is it on? Is it on? Perfect. Yeah, um, so our animal control teams are used to having requests such as that. In a disaster area, um, attending a, a property, we're not allowed to enter a dwelling without owner's consent or a warrant. Um, so we, were, we do have training for those ones. I think one of the things that we're gonna see happening is we're gonna have rescue requests coming and we need to design those teams either as a task force so that those folks are prepared for the security issues. It, it's not always gonna be a fire, it may be a flood. There may be, uh, like I mentioned, there may be rogue groups in town or rogue people, they do storm chase um, and they're there to put something on social media and, and be a hero not necessarily with their own things. Um, as well as the animal handling was one of the biggest challenges that we had was have people that were competent in getting a cat from underneath the mattress or in the drop down ceilings and be patient enough to bring and draw that animal out without too much stress. So they do make decisions when they go in <coughs> whether or not to feed in situ. Um, sometimes a trap may be appropriate. So if you feed the cat for one or two days in the trap without it going closed. And then when you're there, put your trap up, feed it, the cat knows when you're coming. You go outside, the cat 
goes in, trap set, you go and get kitty and, and take it out. Um, and then locksmiths were the big ones. So people do, don't want their property damaged when you go in. So all, all the media that you see at the beginning, oh, going in, kicking in doors, and I, those, those fellows are in trouble now um, with other issues. Hi, uh, I'm Amanda with Second Chance Animal Rescue in Alberta. So I'm going to kind of answer, uh, ask a question I kind of already know the answer to, but only because I feel some smaller, maybe more secluded SPCAs in areas might get something out of it because people that don't know the geography of Fort McMurray who haven't been lucky enough to live there at some point, um, I had a condo there when the fire happened. Um, it's one highway, it's Highway 63, and it runs north through town. Um, and it's fairly it's hard to explain unless you've been there. Uh, when, when the fires happened, and I know that people went south and people went north, um, going south was a lot easier to support because we had Edmonton Union Society and Alberta um, and all those different places. But going north, it was much more secluded. So for people that are maybe in more in secluded areas, how did you manage to support the people that had to flee up the northern part um, because it was more secluded and it's harder to get to once that highway was taken away? That's where the Canadians came in. So WestJet flew them out, uh, Narolta Lodges, all, all the camps. Uh, I, I, you couldn't name all the people that, that did that. And uh, yeah, that, that there wasn't much we could do to even get to them to support. So it was to get them out. Okay. I have a question because we've covered off, um, first of all, my heart goes out to you guys. Um, but I, we've covered off animals that are inside the homes and I've been part in my old job with animal control with large fires in apartment buildings and we we let a lot of people let that kept their animals inside but they also let their animals just go and they were running free to get away have you experienced a lot of that or did most people keep their animals contained and then is there a plan also sorry it's a two part because Jolie asked me to um, with the wildlife returning is there is there have you seen anything about wildlife coming back Thank you. Yep. To answer the, the first question, yes, people let their animals out, um, for sure. And domestic strays are domestic strays. So we, we did um, follow requests and check the homes. If the animal wasn't there or the home had been damaged, as I mentioned before, people like to do things that are great. Um, we would set traps. Uh, there were many domestic strays that got on the bus. We were able to match some of them up. Uh, other ones waited for re-entry. Um, we have an in-care gallery, um, and I know many of the other groups posted these pets as well on as many platforms as we could to give owners support to find those animals. As soon as you see your pet's picture, you're okay to know where to go and get it. As far as wildlife, um, I've, I've spoken with many firefighters. Uh, yeah, the, the bears ran over top of them on the 4th and the 5th, and they were moving away from the fire as they do. Uh, there was a lots of wildlife around the rescue center that we were in, um, working at. Uh, one beautiful silver fox seemed unfazed other than there was a lot more food around than the last time he was walking <laughs> through. Um, Fish and Wildlife from Alberta handles the majority of those calls. We do come across them and they had officers within, within the municipality to handle that. They did the bear trapping, they, any I think they did went after a few foxes as well because the population went up significantly. Um, my name's Kaylee. I'm the executive director for Animal Protection Services of Saskatchewan. Um, a few years ago, LaRange, Saskatchewan had a wildfire situation, obviously not nearly the same scale that you guys dealt with, and the response was obviously nothing like what you guys did. One problem that there was in Saskatchewan was sort of independent rescue groups rushing up north to save animals, in quotation marks. And then the part that I found really s disturbing was sort of unilateral decisions on the part of certain people to not give animals back to the rightful owners. Like, you're not qualified, you're not a good enough dog person to get this dog back. Did you guys have any sort of stuff like that, or was it all uh, well-managed and proper? <laughs> well, I think we did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, no, those people exist, and, and um, 
they get passed on to enforcement. That's the freedom of information. So, I mean, yes, it existed. Yes, people took pets and put them on Kijiji and Facebook and said, you know, for 10 grand, I'll give you Fluffy back. Um, those kind of things do happen. Those things go immediately to law enforcement and not municipal law enforcement, not animal enforcement. That's, that's a different problem when you get into fraud or, or bribery. Um, I, I didn't hear a lot of cases of that, but there was definitely folks in town. Uh, our RCMP team learned a lot about security on a disaster zone. Um, not everybody's with the pet rescue on May the 4th, um, especially when the pet rescue team's not there on May the 4th. I just maybe make a comment. Um, in terms of the number of animals that we had at the park, it was, as I've mentioned, it's just under 1,200. We were able to connect with 91% of the owners that had uh, requested the animals be extracted and brought down to the park. So I think just over 1,000 animals were uh, reclaimed um, or, or certainly claimed by a family member or friend. So in terms of that, we had all of that information about their uh, the owners and their animals, and again, 90, just over 90% were, were reclaimed by their owner. And there was a number that weren't, but again, um, circumstances had changed, so individual, individuals or owners were not able, in some cases, to pick up their, or, or they relinquished their pets because they weren't able to manage them, um, given their circumstances. So at least at this time, uh, fairly significant uh, reclaim numbers. Just one more thing on top of that as well, because you reminded me of it. If you don't have good communication at the beginning of the emergency and, and secure the area, your firefighters will do it for you, your RCMP will do it for you. Um, so if you're gonna have a, a pet rescue plan or a pet recovery plan or a pet sheltering plan for folks, that needs to be communicated largely and clearly before that happens to the firefighters, to the RCMP. One of the jokes, and we kind of laugh a little bit, um, McDonald Island was the original evac center, emergency social services. We saw a few hundred people in a couple of days. They had pets. You could give them the services and say, you know what, you're going to be evacuated for a little while. Someone you can go stay with. What do you need? And, and they would find their way. So we'd, we'd deal with a few hundred people max within the emergency center, 20 to 40 animals. We brought the ones that we had from animal control that were strays. Um, to stay with us. We were dealing no, with no more than 40 animals. When it came to the evacuation time, we got walked over with thousands of people and all their pets with them, and they weren't ready for what they were doing. One lady brought a can opener and then asked me, can, I go, can you go back and get my dog? I forgot my dog, but I've got my can opener. So they weren't in a state of mind to function, to evacuate with everything that they needed. The laughing part of that was when we got back on the on the on the fifth or the fourth, I forget which day we came back. It happened so quickly. Um, <clears throat> the firefighters that had set up shop in Mac Island with all the supplies that we left behind because we we packed and left. Owners that went said, "We'll meet you down. We're all going to Anzac. If you don't have transport or we can't get you on the bus or you don't have gas in your car, we'll meet you down there and we'll all catch up." Well, of course, we left kitty litter and everything else that we needed. It was a perfect setup and that's where the volunteer firefighters slept. So of course they collected pets coming at homes that were on fire and dropped them off there. Um, and quite politely put it in the chief's office as well, two cats that didn't get along, which made excellent mess in all five fire halls. So there is, yeah. So we'll take a last question, Tara. Did you want to ask mm -hmm. one of the last question of right. the entire conference? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Make it a good one. Hi, Tara. Uh, Tara from Central Alberta Humane Society. My question actually is in relation to fundraising because thanks to our extremely generous nation and province, um, we heard that significant funds were raised. And I'm just curious to know if um, I, I already heard from you that that was a challenge to try to manage that. And I think it's given certainly us some great ideas about how we might be able to work with others to help with that. Was it enough? Did you, were you able to access what you needed from the money that was coming in through play? And ha, where, where, what did you apply for? What kind of things could you do? And is it still ongoing now? Are you getting what you need? Um, I mean, certainly there was, you know, massive generosity coming um, 
not only to our agency, but I think to other agencies involved in, in the pet rescue efforts and reunification efforts um, throughout uh, May and June. I mean, certainly, and I mean, there was a statistic posted, uh, I think, by Jeff today with the amount of uh, money flowing into the, the Red Cross and whatnot. And I mean, certainly our organization is working to apply for those grants and uh, funding streams that are uh, that are available to support our continued efforts as we work through the recovery phase and what it is that our community and its pet owners and pets are, are going to need. Um, we anticipate that this is, you know, a, a long-term um, effort. Um, and, and I mean, we certainly hope that the funding will, will keep uh, will keep pace with that, but um, you know, I think we also experienced. We weren't able to really, and and like I mentioned in my uh, in the the notes that I spoke about, um, we didn't have a, sort of a funding mechanism set up for our organization until more than seven days after the the fire started. I mean, of course, there's ways in which you can donate to our agency, but specifically to the the wildfire and the response that would be required that came. That came later, but I think that that speaks to an opportunity for agencies here today and, and otherwise that a formal partnership with an agency outside of your jurisdiction in a safety zone that can advocate on your behalf for, I mean, not only for, you know, fundraising dollars, but also just the, the, the importance of communication for your staff, for your stakeholders, for those that have adopted from you for your community, uh, your community in general, like I mentioned, out of community media needing to understand what is in fact going, going on. Um, and then the material donation piece as well, um, you know, a, a big challenge in the sense of managing that. I mean, we had 300 or 250 pallets come in in a matter of two weeks to a temporary warehouse in Edmonton, but then we now have to get that from Edmonton to Fort McMurray and then sort that and then distribute that which we did, and I mean, through our pet reentry kit program, we delivered supplies to 4,000 pets in 10 weeks, but it, it's, you, you need help. So I think that that formal partnership is key to all elements of continuing your operations as best you can and is success through a disaster, for sure. Thank you, Tara. No, that's okay. It just makes me think about one of the key questions I would have asked and I'll look forward to talking more about as, as this continues to unfold the learnings, is how do we be great allies? So a lot was going on in Alberta, and everybody outside of Alberta was desperate to help, and how can we as this community figure out systems and processes so that we can be your best allies in an emergency? So you've given me some great ideas, and I look forward to talking to all of you and learning more about what you suggest now having the rear window or the rear view into what and how we can all help when the next disaster strikes. So please, can we give a round of applause, not only to the folks here, but everyone in the audience.